Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for August 13th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. I am pleased to be back again with the state delegation update. Today's guest is State Representative Christine Barber. Christine Barber, a little different set for me today. It's a, a glorious day here in Somerville, so I'm trying the outdoors. I'm jealous. Thanks for having me, Joe. Um, nice to see you. My internet does not work in my yard, so I'm stuck inside today, but looks nice there in your yard. We're going to have to give you your internet and your Wi-Fi a little boost there, Christine. So welcome back. I know that um, the state delegation, the state house folks have been working diligently for all the issues uh, during COVID, um, non-COVID related. Um, one of the things I first wanted to do is check in with you. You're doing all right. I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. You're doing okay? Very good. Very good. Life doesn't take a break. Yeah. So, so let's get right to it, Christine. We took a break about four weeks ago, uh, knowing that budget session, was, you were going into full throttle on budget, full throttle on some of the COVID-related bills. Um, I want to let you take it away for a bit, and then a little bit more into the conversation. I do want to talk about a hot topic that is affecting your district of Somerville and Medford, which is the reopening of Tufts University. But let's start with an update from Beacon Hill from Christine Barber. Thanks. So yeah, it's been about a month since I think any of the delegation has been on this show. So thank you for giving us some, some uh, time so we could really dig in. We were voting really 12 hours a day. Um, we have, I think we talked about a remote voting system. So for the most part, we're all on the phone and watching a live stream and trying to keep up with debate. And it's um, a new challenge, but one that we've, we've worked on. So, um, so yeah, we passed actually a number of different bills. Um, so I can kind of hit the high points. I think one of the most important really is um, we extended our legislative session. So typically in the legislature, in an even year, in an election year, we break July 31st, and then we have what's called informal sessions all fall where only non-controversial bills can come up. Um, so we did um, repeal that rule for this year. Thankfully, this is something I've really been pushing on. There's a pandemic, there's many crises facing us. Um, it is not the time to um, take a break. So thankfully we did um, get rid of that rule for this year. So we are still in session. We are still able to vote on many important things that um, are still to come. And we will have to do another budget in October. Our current state budget only gets us through, um, through October. So we will need to do another budget at least. And I'm pushing for a lot of other bills that I think we still need to pass um, to address not just COVID, but many other things that are going on. Um, so that was an important one. Um, something else budget related that um, I wanted to make sure people knew is we did work um, in the House with the Senate and the governor to commit to fully funding Chapter 70, which is the education money from the state um, education and local aid for the entire year. So um, that was, a way to try to help city budgets um, who are all we're all really struggling right now so that we can at least um, pay for the local aid and education funding um, and fingers crossed we will get federal aid to help support um, support some of the budget constraints that we've had Christine a lot of the uh, a lot of the plans that the state house has planned uh, which will trickle down no doubt to the municipalities are predicated on the federal government coming through with a, a cash of uh, a cash of cash um, do we do we know from either of our um, any of our representatives in the Congress or us our, our um, United States senators what their feeling is about whether or not we're actually going to get that federal relief I mean, my sense is they've all been fighting hard and feeling frustrated like we all are um, we saw what um, the person in DC did last week about the executive orders, which didn't come close to meeting our needs. Um, but, um, you know, our, our members of Congress and the Senate have been really pushing for, for 
federal aid to help us. Um, and I think they're frustrated as well. So I continue to be hopeful um, that we will get federal money because we are in a pretty critical um, hole in the state budget. Um, while we've committed to the education and local aid, there are many other issues that we fund, you know, from housing to healthcare to courts and legal aid and all sorts of things that we fund from the state that we're really worried about. Um, I did file a bill to require corporations to pay uh, their fair share of taxes on offshore profits. Um, that's something I'm going to push for this fall, especially if the feds don't come through. Um, we've got to make sure everyone's paying their fair share, at least to help get us through this crisis. Let's go back to housing for one bit, if we could, Christine. Um, as you know, there are or tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people in this state, and even more so across the United States, who are very, very housing insecure at this point. They don't know what's gonna happen. Nobody's coming forth with a rock solid plan. Um, the banks are worried. The property owners are worried. The renters are worried. This is a worry fest like I have never seen before. And there are no answers coming for the critical questions. We had an initiative on Beacon Hill for rent control. My understanding is that failed, is that correct? Yeah, so um, in we, we voted on an economic development bill, but that there was a, a number of housing pieces in there. Um, so I can talk through some of the ones that were successful, but there was a vote um, Mike Connolly pushed on rent control that I voted for. I think, I presume the whole Somerville delegation voted for it and it did fail. Um, How about the ones that passed? The ones in terms that passed. Of housing? I should say the bill isn't final yet. They're in a conference committee working out differences with the Senate. But the, the good things that got through um, a branch include the tenant right to purchase, um, which has also been something filed, I know, by Rep Provo and, and some others, um, where if a building, it's particularly large larger buildings, which we've had some in Somerville that have um, come up for sale or even been foreclosed on and it would give the tenants an opportunity to purchase that even with a co-op or SCC or something like that with them. Um, so that got in, which is, which is great. Um, doubling the low income housing tax credit, which is actually something that helps finance affordable housing. So um, it is a big deal. It's um, for making more affordable housing. Um, notifying better notice for tenants and this is something we do in Somerville already but statewide to make sure tenants get notifications of mediation and all of their options when they're facing um, eviction um, and then the Senate version included um, right to counsel which is making sure everyone who is in an eviction or a housing case um, can have a lawyer which is often there's a huge imbalance in those cases and eviction sealing, which would make sure that your record of eviction, and this is particular an issue in communities of color where people are unable to get housing because of um, what's happened in their past, sometimes what's happened in their family that had nothing to do with them. So to be able to seal some of the eviction records. Um, so while- Just, I'm sorry, there, one question on the eviction part of it, that yeah. would be during the pandemic? For, from right. a date certain through, or is that for all time? My, my memory is it's for all time. Okay, thank you. So there's, there's many more things I wanna see on housing, but there were some things that, that got in there um, that I'm hopeful will get signed into law soon. Um, but more to do on tenant protections and the transfer fee and rent control that we were not you know, successful on. Um, funding for schools. Yeah. What have we got for an update on that? Any emergency funding coming to Somerville Public Schools, Medford Public Schools? Um, yeah, so as I said, the, 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 there are fully funded at, without cuts at the state level from last year. So I know both Medford and Somerville were very worried about cuts. My understanding is, in Med, so in Medford, they, were, they had laid off teachers. I know they're in the process of bringing back most if not all of those teachers because of the funding information which is great but we know obviously with coronavirus there's so many costs so we did create some grant programs for schools um, to pay for 
um, extra costs due to coronavirus. Um, we all know Somerville is starting the year remotely, um, but there are costs still to families of making sure kids are connected and have what they need to actually be learning at home. Um, Medford, by my last count, has not made a final decision about um, what they're going to do, but they've laid out a number of options. I, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, I thought the deadline was last Friday. Did they extend that uh, for they the school system? They did extend system? the deadline, and I'm not remembering to when, but they did extend it um, because there's been a realization at the state level, although um, I think they have not been giving enough flexibility at the state level to districts to figure out what works best for them. Um, I mean, some community, I am supportive of Somerville's decision um, to go not to go back remotely for now, given our density as a city and the school infrastructure, uh, it was not gonna work. So um, I know it's a really hard decision and, um, you know, it will impact education, but this is a public health crisis and we need to keep our kids, families, teachers, we need to keep people safe. And as of noontime today, I was listening to Mayor Marty Walsh of Boston on one of the talk radio shows and his update to the city. It sounds like Boston is leaning very heavily towards remote and they are not reopening until the 21st of September. Uh, what, what's the estimated opening date for Medford and Somerville schools, do you recall? I do, in Medford, I do recall that it's mid-September, so they are um, they are delaying that at least. So yes, I don't. Yeah, it it kind of sounds like all the school systems are starting to realize that the inner city schools or the metropolitan district schools, whether it's Boston and and Metro Region and Worcester and Springfield and Lawrence, where they have. Um, infrastructure difficulties. And those, uh, when I say infrastructure, it doesn't just mean the older buildings. It could be, you know, in terms of busing, how do you get kids back and forth between the schools and their home? I mean, all of those, all of those um, pieces of the puzzle had not been worked out. And I don't think the state realized how difficult it was going to be for the municipalities when they set the date of last Friday. I mean, that's, you know, by the end of August, you got to have all of this in play. Um, so hence the mid-September opening and the extended deadline for a plan. Yeah, the other piece is MCAS. Um, I just um, signed on a letter and I saw Senator Jalen had her own letter um, about um, not doing the MCAS next year. I mean, for kids to come in and teachers to have the pressure of that on top of just trying to stay safe and, and get some learning in, um, it's not the time. Isn't there some kind of a movement to suspend MCAS for at least four years? Did I misread that someplace? There is, right? There's, a, there's been a movement on moratorium for MCAS, um, you know, and especially to tie it to high stakes and to funding. This is absolutely the wrong direction to be going in. Um, but to, um, to say that as we get through this and even recover from it, we know kids are learn have lost just in the time they've been out of school that um, they have, they've, lost some of their um, traction and learning. So we're gonna have to, you know, it's gonna be a long recovery in a lot of ways and we have to acknowledge that. I, I wanna throw one more thing in there that um, covers both your, both the municipalities in your district, which are Somerville and Medford. Um, I, I, if you've noticed, I keep muting myself because there is the continued construction of the Green Line. And I live extremely, extremely close to one of the stations. Um, but I, I did take a walk uh, last week and I was looking at the progress and it is amazing how fast that is moving mm -hmm. along. The sound walls and the slurry walls and the retaining walls are all going up extremely fast. So if you see me keep muting, it's not that I don't wanna say anything, Christine, it's because the background noise, um, well, I suppose it's a good thing that we can hear the background noise, that construction continues, but any update on um, how Medford is feeling about the construction um, in their well, community? Thank you for, I know a lot of neighbors are putting up with a lot of noise at all hours, so um, we I've definitely heard how challenging that is, so um, thank you for you know being patient. Nope. And the Broadway Bridge is open, which is one good, you know, like the best news all, all year is that the Broadway Bridge is, is mostly reopened. They've had to close it a little bit 
for things time to time, but they are moving. Don't tell my friends in Medford, I empathize with them. I live very close to it too, so. Um, yeah, um, but in Medford, it's coming along as well. Um, there's a lot of changes at the College Ave stop um, based on what Tufts is doing there. Um, they're building a, a large building as well. Um, so there's some extra construction, but um, particularly around Broadway Bridge, it's gone very fast and there has been a lot of construction noise to deal with, but we're getting to the other side of it. And I believe they're still on schedule. We've been getting some, some good updates, so. Good. Yeah, we're planning a fall update. Um, as you know, I've interviewed John Dalton, the executive, uh, the uh, general manager for the Green Line Extension. John will be coming back in late September to give another update uh, to the community. So we look forward to that. Christine, anything else in terms of the update from Beacon Hill while you've been sunning on the shores of Aruba over the last four yeah, months? Yeah, it's been really um, a nightmare <laughs> in um, my dining room. Stuck, I'm like chained to my dining room table for, anyway, worst places I could be. So um, yeah, we actually have passed a number of bills. So we just did a, a, a tra what I think is a transformative climate change bill um, that sets very clear, uh, stronger standards for the state to meet to get to zero emissions. Um, and that is a bill that was one of my priorities, a priority of the Progressive Caucus. So I'm glad that we passed it. Um, and we also were able to include environmental justice in that, which is a issue and a bill that many of us have worked on for a long time. So in environmental justice communities, which are those that have a higher rate of um, people with low incomes and people of color, there'll be a, a stronger process for actually citing um, uh, any kind of changes to the energy infrastructure. And these are communities that have been the hardest hit by climate change. So it's a good um, positive change and I got some some things in the climate change bill about zero emission vehicles we've been trying to um, beef up the infrastructure for for EVs um, and uh, you know make sure that people um, have the option to to charge and make that a little bit more of a, a normal thing around the Commonwealth so we were able to do that um, so the climate change bill is a good bill and also in final negotiations with the Senate and we also passed a police accountability bill, which um, was a, a gigantic bill that took many days of debate. Um, but I could I try to sum up quickly, I guess. It's doable. Um, I think the biggest part of that bill is the ability to decertify police officers. So there's a new independent board that where there's police misconduct, they can actually decertify um, and and um, limit qualified immunity for, for those police officers. And it's really the, it's the first time we've had an independent board, law enforcement is not on it, and they will be able to oversee the police. So there's a number of changes in that bill that are, that are also good, but I think that's the most important part. Um, you know, it, it limits use of force and bans chokeholds um, and, limits no-knock warrants, um, does a lot of important changes. It's a step, there's so much more to do and more conversations to have there. Um, and some places I would like to go further, but you know, for the, the timing, I think it, it's an important step. And it does hit the, um, the points that the Black and Latino Caucus had said were most uh, critical to deal with first. And that's something that, you know, I've been working with them and, and trying to, you know, listen and have them lead on this issue. And they've been amazing. So what it does sound like is that, um, you know, the people of color and the people who are most affected by bad behavior by police um, were pushing for independent review of that behavior rather than having internal investigations by the police department about their own behavior. So it is a critical first step to have independent review and independent authority to do something about bad behavior by the police. Yeah, and it's something that hadn't been done before. So this is a, a new way of doing that. Um, something that honestly communities of color have been pushing for a long time. So I'm glad that as, as horrible as everything that has been happening is, the protests and the um, talk about it has, you know, have been transformative and have really brought this to light and um, shown that, um, you know, by, you know, 
all of us <laughs> acknowledging police brutality and really we can do something about it. And there, as I said, a lot more to do, but the independent um, board is important. And at the state level, you know, it's different than at, at the city level. Um, so this is something we can do at the state level um, to, set, to set the standards and the laws for, for all police. Well, speaking about behavior of institutions, um, let's go into one thing I did want to cover, which is the reopening plan uh, for Tufts University. Covers both parts of your district, uh, Somerville and Medford. I know you've heard an earful uh, from residents. Um, we have had two um, public meetings or hearings. Uh, one was a community meeting last week and the other was quickly followed up by a Somerville City Council meeting um, asking Tufts University to share in depth their plan for reopening campus to students, uh, faculty, and visitors. So what is your take on the plan? Um, what do you think will happen? And uh, I know you wanna talk about something that you and a couple of the city councilors here in Somerville uh, just sent to Dr. Monaco at Tufts. So this is something that I have been hearing about um, from constituents, uh, activists, people in my neighborhood and outside of my neighborhood for weeks. So since Tufts made the announcement, I think it's been six or seven weeks since they made the announcement that they are fully um, coming back in person, that um, there has been a lot of um, conversations and concerns from, from my constituents that I've been hearing in Somerville and in Medford. Um, and my district does um, bridge the whole campus and, um, and the neighborhoods around it. Um, so the main concerns are about, um, are, are about the off-campus students and the testing and, and standards um, for them. So the concerns that I'm hearing and that I, I echo is that um, we know there's a lot of students, it's a little more than half, I think, who typically live off campus at Tufts. And we presume that'll be more this year because of social distancing and the need for space, but there's even more students who are, who are living in the neighborhoods. Um, and so Tufts has, does have a, um, a protocol for wearing masks and getting students tested. Um, but the concerns are about um, looking at the governor's travel ban. How is that um, coming into play? So students, I, I know because I live very close to Tufts, they're here already. So they're not getting tested. They're here. They moved in in August to get apartments. And I understand that. Um, it's not clear in the, in the standards if um, and when they will start being required to be tested and wear masks. Um, and it, I believe, is going to be challenging to enforce off campus. And I think that is, you know, a challenge for Tufts, but one that I'd like to hear more information about. How are you enforcing this? Your, your students are off campus and, and what can you actually do to keep the neighborhood safe? We know we're in one of the most densely populated uh, cities in, um, in the East, we are very close to COVID hotspots and we, you know, we want to maintain everyone's public health, including the students. Well, let me ask you, let me ask a question about that, Christine, and in no way, shape or form am I coming to Tufts defense. However, you have students from all over the globe coming back into the metropolitan Boston area, including Somerville and Medford, who may not be attending Tufts. How do you enforce Tufts University requiring their off campus students to get tested if you're not doing it for BU and Harvard and anybody else who may be bringing their students back? Yeah, I think it's a question for every um, private institution to be saying how, how are we going to address this? We can't presume that every young person or per any person, of course, is a tough student. We do know that thousands of people um, who will be coming to Somerville from other states that have higher um, risk and higher levels of COVID um, are coming because of Tufts and Tufts' decision to reopen in person. So um, if that's the case, then we want to have really strong protocols to, to protect as many people as possible. So things like the governor's order for quarantining requires someone to stay um, to um, 
stay away from other people and use their own bathroom. And, you know, I, in any um, apartment that I have been in in Somerville, there usually aren't bathrooms for every person, right? If you have three roommates, you're usually all sharing. So there are ways to get around that and ways to, I know Tufts is trying to stagger students. I'd like more information coming to, coming to residents, um, more clarity on the testing and more clarity on the enforcement. Um, so I did just pen a open letter to President Monaco, um, and I worked on that with Councillor Valentine from Ward 7, um, at large Councillor Rossetti, and Councillor um, Nicole Morell, who is from Medford. And, and what's your sense? Is Tufts going to back down and go virtual, or are they going to stick with their plan? I mean, that is up to Tufts. I mean, from what I've seen, they are committed to this plan. And um, I think that there's more that they need to do to, um, to ensure that all of us are safe, that their students and their workers um, on campus um, are safe and that all residents are also, are also safe and feeling like we all have the information um, and that we're all being respectful and responsible um, as much as possible. So. Yeah, and you, know, you and I were talking before the show, Christine, I mean, in another, wor another hat that I wear here in the city, I was on a call with the uh, Boston Licensing Commission uh, earlier today, and one of the dilemmas that they have when it comes to restaurants and the hotel industry and everything else is trying to get across to visitors, not just students, but anyone coming from out of state back into Massachusetts, is that we have certain protocols that are in place for our restaurants, for our hotels, for our schools, for everything else. We have to make a concerted effort, we meaning government, in my other world I have a government hat on, we have to make that concerted effort to get the information out that you're coming back into an environment here in Massachusetts, we have rules, we have regs, please abide by them to help us keep you safe and everybody else safe. And I think that's the best all of us can do at this point. Yeah, and we've been through a surge. We know how horrible that is. Um, we've lost a lot of residents. We are vigilant and we need to keep being vigilant. And I, you know, I appreciate Somerville's caution in that regard. And I hope that um, we can all keep you know, looking out for each other and doing what we need to do to stay safe. Christine Barber, always good to have you. Glad you're back, uh -huh. glad Thanks you're safe. You um, we may or may not see you next week. It depends on who wins the arm wrestling contest in the state delegation. We'll Thank see. You. Thanks for joining us. For Somerville Media Center Live, I'm Joe Lynch. My guest has been State Representative Christine Barber. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next week.